quite popular series of virtual events. Um, this is the second in the episode, um, which we are delighted to be supporting. And we are um, supported in partnership with the Cricket Society. Uh, well, welcome on behalf of the Cricket Society in England, who are co-hosting this event. I'm speaking from a rather damp west of England, uh, where we all remember Mike, Mike Proctor, as one of the truly great overseas players, 14 summers, giving his all to Gloucestershire. And later in the session, we're going to be joined by two of his teammates from that time, Jack Davey and Andy Brassington. So very much looking forward to a West Country flavour to it. But of course, Mike was much more than that. He was a great, great South African cricketer in a great South African team that was captained at the end of the first era of South African cricket before the ban by Dr. Ali Barker, who is also on the call today. So we're going to have some fascinating talk about South African cricket as well. I've spoke, met Mike a few times and I'm immensely impressed by him. He's a man who could have been one of the all-time greats of Test cricket, but because of politics was deprived of that opportunity. But nevertheless, he's got no trace of bitterness about that. And he gives his all to his life, just as he did on the cricket field all those years ago. And his great passion these days is the charity he set up. He went into this school, Ottawa School in Durban, to help out with some cricket. And so overwhelmed by the needs of the children, 90% of whom come from AIDS-ravaged families, that he's thrown himself into much more than just the cricket in the life of the school. So one of the purposes of this session is to raise money for the Mike Proctor Foundation in the work they do. And it's a terrific charity because it's so focused on the needs of a group of people. The money gets where it's needed straight away. And I've nothing but admiration for the, what Mike's doing in that charity. And I think those of us in England, for all our problems, we don't have a quarter of the difficulties that they, those children have. If we can do everything we can to help it, I think we should. And, uh, Nigel Hancock is going to speak at the end of the meeting from the Cricket Society further about that. So welcome to you all. Uh, looking forward enormously to this session. And I now pass over to Roger, who's going to conduct the interview. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, one and all. Uh, my name is Roger Cooper. I'm a trustee of the Mike Proctor Foundation. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Stephen, for those kind words and for um, um, prompting the need for for you know donations i mean that's 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 the reality of 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 charity charities these days particularly during the pandemic um as michelle said this is the second in a series of uh, talks with mike proctor and various guests that he brings on all of whom um have a obviously a cricketing background and uh, and uh, the last one we had with barry richards was fascinating and I think this one with Dr. Ali Baka is going to be equally, equally fascinating. Um, before we get into it, Mike's going to say a few words about the, about the foundation. Uh, and um, uh, I'll, so I'll, I'll hand straight over to him, in fact, for, to, to say that. Thanks very much, uh, Roger. And to Stephen, thanks very much for those, those kind words. You, you make me blush a little bit, actually. But uh, thanks very much. I do appreciate it. And I do appreciate the work that uh, a lot of English people, particularly in the Gloucestershire area, have helped me with, uh, with my foundation. Just to tell you a little bit of what we did during the lockdown, and we've all had a, a, a very tough year. And I was very fortunate to, to have a sponsor in Hollywood Bets and Spa. And we managed to drop 450 food parcels in uh, the Ottawa area uh, from the Ottawa school. Uh, we managed to, to get to, to give out 450 food parcels, which weighed just under six tons. And um, a lot of work and a lot of effort goes into that. That's a, that's a, that's a, lot, of, uh, a lot of food given out. And it's only possible because of sponsors and for the likes of you and for everyone else um, who's, who's joined hands with, with my charity and helped the children of Ottawa. It really is satisfying to see it. And just to say thanks very much. We, we, we got some great donations last time. Um, the Ottawa School, Miss Masani, the principal, and I didn't notice it. Something you don't even really notice, but she wants, wanted a lot, a lot of benches at the school. And I was just looking back, and I've never really noticed it. But, you know, there's not one bench. It's not a huge school, 1,200 kids, but it's not a huge area. And there's nowhere to sit other than in the classroom 
or in the library, which we, we opened about a month ago. Um, so thank you all very much. There's always a need for to do something at Ottawa. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, really, I look forward to, to speaking to the good doctor and Brassi and uh, Jack. Um, so uh, welcome to Ali Baka as well. Um, uh, just a few points about uh, Ali, in case people are not that familiar with, uh, with him. Uh, um, he was a South African test cricketer and captain of the national side in 1970, as Stephen mentioned. Uh, multiracial cricket in South Africa during the period of isolation and keeping the interest going in, in the sport of cricket. Um, it's also fair to say that Ali was one of the driving forces behind um, the, the drive to get uh, readmittance into international sport and international cricket in particular in the early 1990s, and, and we'll come on to that. Uh, these days, Ali is chairman of, uh, of the board of a, um, a leading healthcare and nonprofit um, organization in South Africa called Right to Care, one of the first organizations as I understand it, to make HIV treatment available to public patients in South Africa. So welcome, uh, Ali. Um, I understand, Ali, you'd like to say a few words about your, um, your um, uh, cricket relationship with Mike over the years. So um, perhaps I can just hand over to you to do that, to start with. Well, firstly, thank you for your kind words and the, and the invitation. So it's my pleasure. Mike went to a private school called Hilton High School near Peter Maritzburg. And I can recall a comment by the late Jackie McGlue, who was captain of South Africa in the late 50s. He went public that he'd seen or uh, Mike Proctor play, and he was still at school, that he was good enough then to play for the Natal Provincial team. And many of us in Johannesburg read this, and we thought that Jackie had lost it. 1965, uh, I was selected to tour England uh, with the South African cricket team. It was my first time I was selected for South Africa. And one of the games we were going to have was against Gloucestershire. And when we arrived at Gloucestershire, we, there was a big announcement by the officials that uh, in the team to play against South, South Africa were two young South Africans, Barry Richards and Mike Proctor. And Mike, I can tell you, we weren't so happy, you know, these two young upstarts from South Africa trying to upstage us. And they did, because they batted first on the first day. The score must have been about 40 for four. And the two youngsters came into bat. They both got half centuries, not out. And then the rain came. And that was the end of our match against Gloucestershire. It rained for about two and a half days. We now get back to South Africa and uh, we play on Boxing Day against the Tell. I'm Captain Transwell. And it's the first time I saw Mike Proctor bowl. I've never seen a fast bowler with such a long run up. He came thudding in. A lot of people thought that he bowled with the wrong foot, which is not true. And he bowled late in swingers. And Mike, I think I got a few runs that day. So I was quite happy with my performance, but you could see immediately that here was a gifted, a gifted cricketer of the highest quality. Then in February of the next year, we have our return match against Natal in Durban. And day one, I won the toss and we bat first. And we score about 260, 270, not bad. Day two comes and you won't believe it, Natal of about 19 for four wickets. Colin Wesley's out. Lee Irvin's out. I think Jackie McGrew's out. And our wicketkeeper was the late Johnny White, who probably was South Africa's best ever wicket batsman. And I can remember having a discussion with him in between overs. I'm the captain. I don't know whether it came from him or me, but one of us said, should we enforce the follow-on? And then... Immediately, in came Mike Proctor. It was a seven and a half hours day's play. We never got another wicket the whole day. Very first sale scored 200, and Mike Proctor got his first maiden century. So that was the first time I saw the brilliance of him, not only as an all-rounder, but as a batsman. 
I then go to Rhodesia. Uh, Bulawa, my proctor is now in Rhodesia, he's captain. I'm captain of Transvaal. And we come to day three, and we've lost on the first innings. We only get one point. Rhodesia could get three points, uh, one point. And if they beat us outright, they get three points. So I was quite happy just to lose on the first innings because we knew that when they came to the Wanderers with a higher bounce and faster pitches, we'll probably take them on. So we're batting out the second innings and about 70 for naught. And I sweep a bowler. I think his name was Koshula. And I'm caught on the boundary. And it's about 70 for one. I then go in the change room, take off my pads, come to watch my batsman play. And the next thing I see, my proctor bowling off breaks. Off breaks. He took nine wickets that day, bowling off break, and we lost on the double. Showing the amazing versatility of this magnificent cricketer. Right, we then play against the Australians, and Mike came in the first series against Bobby Simpson's team in the third test in Durban. So he played three tests there. We then played them in 1917 when we beat them for love in Johannesburg. And in seven tests, he took 41 test wickets. So how good is Mike Proctor, in my opinion? I think there have been some great all-rounders in the late 70s, the 80s. So Ian Botham, Sir Richard Hadley, Kapil Dev, uh, Imran Khan. In my opinion, there be can, uh, no question that Mike Proctor was in that category of players for his brilliant performance as an all-rounder. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ali. Um, that's a, um, that covers some of the ground I'm going to cover in a little more detail now. So we'll go back to that game at Bristol in 1965. And you've said about the, the, you know, the two young upstarts making their debuts for Gloucestershire, who were South Africans daring to take on the touring South African side and taking Gloucestershire's score from something in the order of 60, I think it was 60 something for four to 178 for five. Uh, and unfortunately, then the, the match was rained off. So um, you didn't get to see him bowl at that time. Mike, would you like to just say what your memories are of that match? Well, unfortunately, as, as Doc said, there was a lot of rain. But I remember being very excited with Barry. You know, we, we uh, were over there playing the Gloucester second eleven as Gloucester wanted us, Barry and I, um, to, st to uh, stay over. Uh, and qualified to play for Gloucestershire in the county games. And the rules then were um, no overseas players, but overseas, overseas players could obviously play out of the county championship, uh, which meant that Barry and I had the opportunity to play against the touring team, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, and that, uh, that type of team. Um, so we were picked to play for Gloucestershire against South Africa. And it was a, a pretty strong South African side. Um, but we didn't have much opportunity to get together, funnily enough. Uh, but I remember Barry and I getting together. And I think the score was, I think Doc said about 40 or 50, about 60 odd, I think it was, for four. And the wicket was, was doing a bit, doing a bit uh, early in the season. Uh, it seemed, seemed around a lot. And the, South Africa had a, had a pretty strong attack. And then it was decided that uh, Graham Pollock should come on and bowl. Now, Jeeps, as he is, is, is known in South Africa, uh, was a, a makeshift bowler. He was a, a guy that came on to, to break up a partnership. And that's exactly what he did. I think I hold out at back of square leg and Barry went for a cut and he got caught behind. So there we were against the, the might of South Africa, uh, having sort of put on just over 100 for Gloucester against our teammates. Um, we were bowled out by a part-time bowler. So... Um, that was a bit disappointing that we didn't didn't follow through. And the disappointing part was that we never had any more play. I think uh, we, we bowled a couple of overs in the evening, the first day, and uh, the next two days we rained out. So that was very disappointing. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. Let's fast forward about 18 months uh, to when you made your debut for South Africa in January 1967. Um, Ali touched on it, um, but... Um, I understand, Mike, that you actually played, uh, you were 12th man for a couple of the games for the first and second test matches in that series. And you you got on and you 
you actually took a couple of catches. Do you want to mention anything about that? Yeah, I, I remember it very well. Obviously, very, very excited to, to be named as, as 12th man. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't think I was going to get included in the South African team. And so uh, to be made 12th man, it was very exciting for, from my point of view. And I remember, and I think Ollie will remember it as well, is Colin Bland uh, was injured. He dived, he dived uh, into the, into the uh, paling at, at the Wondrous and did his knee in. Uh, so I came in for, for the rest of the, the innings, which I think it might have happened during the second innings or part of the first innings when Australia batted. And then I fielded the whole of the second innings. And in fact, um, Trevor Goddard got the last two wickets. And I caught one at leg slip and one at sort of leg gully, the last two catches, which for me was was very exciting. So um, it was it was a great introduction for me, um, being 12th man. And then uh, 12th man in Cape Town. And Ollie will remember that very well because Graham got injured. And there were a number of other injuries in that game. So I think we had, I was 12th man on the field for the duration of, of the time we fielded. And we had another couple of 12th men on as well because we had huge injury problems and we lost that test. But uh, we, we ended up winning the series, as you know. Yeah, and from, um, from, from that game at Newlands, you moved the, the series moved on to Kingsmead in Durban and that's where you made your full uh, international debut. And that must have been quite something in, at your home ground, presumably in front of your family and friends. Um, have you got any memories of that? And perhaps Ali may have some memories of that as well. Jackie McGrew was captain of Natal. And um, Eastern Province had to, had to bat for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes of the second evening. And the weekend was turning a bit. And Jackie gave the ball to Pat Trimborn, who ended up playing for South Africa because he had a very good seam bowler, and to Norman Crooks, an off spinner. And there where I was, uh, champing at the bit, trying to show the selectors that I could bowl. Um, and was was pretty annoyed about it all. Uh, but Jackie did inform me that, uh, you know, the team had been ticked and I might, I might be in it or might not. But very exciting to play in um, at Kingsmead uh, in front of my home crowd. Uh, obviously, my family, friends, we were all there. So very, very exciting. In Cape Town, I had a bad match. I was bowled out twice by Graham McKenzie, who was the best overseas bowler I'd ever faced. So the third test, you know, I was in a precarious position. You know, if I don't make runs, I'm, I'm history. Um, and I remember very clearly we won the, the toss and we batted. And at one minute to 11, play was supposed to start at 11. The game started and Graham McKenzie ran up very gently and just got his arm over. A slow full toss to Eddie Bowler, who hit it straight back to Graham McKenzie, and he was out first ball naught. So I'm in, and you can imagine my nerves, because uh, it was make or break time for me. But fortunately, I got runs in both innings, and I survived and carried on playing for South Africa. I always tell people that, because I was batting number three then, that my best performance in test cricket is that I kept out the great Barry Richards for five test matches. <laughs> because he was next in line to take over from me. And I always tell Barry that that's my best test performance. But uh, Mike just thundered in. I mean, you could see you know, the anxiety that he created because they had a very good batting team there. You know, Bobby Simpson, Bill Laurie, Ian Chappell, et cetera. But uh, we won that test. We won the fourth test. Now, the fourth test, uh, day five, it rained all day. They would have lost that test match as well. And then we won in Port Elizabeth. So we won that series 3-1. That's the first time ever an Australian test team had been defeated in South Africa. And as I said, had it not rained in the fourth test match, on the final day, that series would have been won for us 4-1. Thank you. You actually made, uh, according to my notes, you made 47 in that, uh, in that match at uh, Kingsmead when... Uh, when Eddie Barlow was out uh, for for a duck, so you were and, and definitely opening. Sixty not opening. out in the second innings. I must say that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll let you. I'll let you say that. Uh, okay. And Mike, Mike in that match took seven wickets. So seven wickets on your debut was was pretty good. But you weren't so good with the bat, though, Mike. Do you remember what happened um, when you batted in that game? Bad memories seem to escape my mind, Roger. 
Well, I'll tell I you. I, got out. I think I think actually I was I was dropped off off, uh, off, off Dave Rennenberg, one of their fast bowlers, by Brian Tabor, Brian Tabor, and uh, then I managed to get get a single. Very very nervous, and then I managed to to nick one and got out. I think I may have scored one, but um, the batting batting side uh, the memories weren't too great at that, that stage. No, you were you were bowled out for one. That's right. And and Ali, you're quite right. You were um, you saw the you saw South Africa home um, in the second innings to win by eight wickets, and you were 60, 60 not out. So yeah, some great memories. Thank you. The second Test series in nineteen seventy, and by this time the storm clouds are gathering a bit in terms of uh, the political situation. Um, and Mike, you played in all four of those test matches. And as Ali said, um, uh, you, uh, you thrashed the Australians 4-0. Thrashed being my word, not Ali's. And, um, but I know it's of great pride to you that you were able to do that. Um, do you have any memories that you'd like to share, both of you, of that test series? I'd just like to say, yeah, and uh, Ali gave me some, some nice applauded up front, but I would just like to say that, you know, I've been privileged to play uh, with some great captains. I mean, I had Jackie McGlue in, in Natal, Barry Festfeld, uh, Trevor Goddard was captain for a while, Peter Vandermeer was captain of South Africa. And, uh, you know, I've always had a, a great, been a great admirer of Ollie as a captain. He captained Transvaal when he was, was very young. And he also captained, uh, I think it was Southern Suburbs, Ollie, correct me, which is a club side, which was a pretty rough area and he had some rough cookies in the team and he managed to captain that well. And he captained us in 1970 brilliantly. I mean, he says he didn't have anything to do, but I can assure you uh, everyone had great respect for Ali. And as far as I'm concerned, and I've said it before, you know, he was the best captain I've, I've ever, ever played under. And, um, you know, I, I did appreciate him. And he, he played, whatever he says, he played a, he played a role in, in, in us winning 4-0. There's no doubt about that. Thank Ali. you, Mark. Thank you, Thank you Mike. Well, that, that, that team was, you know, we, we had some brilliant players. We knew it. Graham Pollock, Barry Richards, Mike Proctor, Lee Irvin, um, Peter Pollock. This went on and on, Trevor Goddard. And we knew we, we would beat those Australians. We, we didn't boast. We didn't shout the odds. We just knew deep down that we were better than them and that we would you know, give them a, a big defeat. I think particularly of... The third test match was at the Wanderers. Our, our, my batting lineup for the second innings was as follows. Uh, Eddie Barlow, Barry Richards, I batted three. Graham Pollock batted four. Lee Irvin batted five. Dennis Lindsay batted six, who in the previous series scored over 600 runs against Australians. Tiger Loss. A top all-rounder, batted seven. Mike batted eight. And I think back, Mike, I mean, Mike could have batted on his own without his bowling in any test side at number five. So he was number eight. Trevor Goddard was nine. Peter Pollock was 10. And Peter Pollock had quite a few half centuries in test cricket. And John Tricast was number 11, who hardly bowled his off spin and was a brilliant closer wicket catcher. So you look at that team. And... Peter Pollock, who I still remain very close to, oh, he phoned me about five, six, seven years ago that he'd read a book in cricket by some cricket historian who knew his cricket. And this gentleman, I can't remember his name, was on record as saying that our 1970 team was one of the best 10 teams of all time in world cricket. They didn't say who was number one, number two, uh, and so, you know, that, that was pretty a formidable team. And, you know, had there been a fifth test match, it would have been five, love, you can take us red. But sad to say, that was the end. And uh, you had these brilliant young cricketers, you know, whose, Barry only played four tests. Lee Irvin only played four tests. Mike played seven tests. It goes on and on. So, you know, one of the tragedies of our apartheid past history so many great South African sportsmen were not given the opportunity of displaying and showing their brilliance to the world public. I think that's one of the, thank you, Ali. I think that's one of the big what if questions, isn't it, of cricket? It, um, 
what if that South African team had played against uh, the Australians and the West Indies, the great Australian and West Indies teams of the mid and late 70s? Um, that would have been quite a contest, to say the least. Um, Roger, can you just ask Ali um, if, he remem- if he remembers that, obviously he remembers that partnership between, between Graham and Barry. I think I think Ollie was run out. You were run out just before lunch. Ollie, you, do you recall that? Because there's a little story I want to tell about you if, if you remember that that game in particular. Well, look, it, it, uh, it it's quite interesting, Mark. You bring this up. It was a hot day. There was such excitement in Durban about this team that beat an Australian Cape and coming to Newlands. I said to Bill Laurie, the Australian captain, I said, look, there's such excitement. No TV. But people on the radio, if they hear that South Africa says batting, and what time the game starts, they'll come and flood, you know, come to the grounds. So he agreed to an early spin. I won the toss, and I mean, it was such a good batting pitch and such a good weather. So, of course, I said, uh, we'll bat first. I recall that the umpires at New at Kingsmead, they were at, 40, at 90 degrees to the main pitch. And it so happened, and Michael remember that they were placed almost underground, that from their change room, they couldn't see the pitch. So they never knew that we'd spun early. And then at about two minutes before half past, of course, you could, they could do a second cutting on the grass at half past 10, half an hour before 11 o'clock. They came out and they decided to give a second cutting, which they were permitted to do. Um, so why I'm telling you this because it came out much later down the years that Ian Chappell um, went public that I cheated that I was part of the umpires giving a second cutting which is absolute rubbish and I remember phoning the umpire uh, my his name he was a civil engineer from Durban Gordon Draper oh. Gordon Draper, correct. I phoned him and I said, you know, this is what Ian Chappell's saying. He said, Oli, you could tell Ian Chappell that the amount of grass we cut up, cut off on the second cutting couldn't fill a teaspoon. Okay. So so that's the one part about it, you know. So you can take it as red. Ian Chappell and myself have never been the best of friends ever since that. I think Anyhow, he, Ian Chappell so, managed to upset quite a few people during his career. Yeah, yeah. No, it didn't upset me. I just, anyhow. So we go to bat, and I get in at about 10 to 1. And my Barry's on about 96, am I right? Correct. So, yeah, so I think there are two overs to go. So I want to give him the strike. So one of their bowlers, I think it was, it wasn't Graham McKenzie. Anyway, Colony. came round the... Who was it? Helen Colony. Yeah. So he came round the wicket. And I ran down the wickets just to kind of push it, to dot the ball, run and give him the strike. So I don't know, my footwork must have been all crazy because I must have run at an angle because he bowled me around my legs. So I was out and uh, he never got his 100 before lunch. Anyhow, so in comes Graham Pollock. And I don't think I've ever seen... In that period from lunch to tea, batting that was displayed by those two great players that afternoon. I think in a in 120 minutes, they probably got about 160 runs. And they slaughtered the Australians. Barry got out at 140. Brilliant knock. You know, Graham Pollock uh, didn't like to be up stage. So he went one stage further and he got 274. And as I said to you before, I don't think I've ever or will ever see batting like it was displayed by those two great batsmen uh, during that test match. Mike, what would you remind me about? Well, yeah, I mean, you described that this cap brilliantly. It was an unbelievable display of batting, it really was. But I didn't realise that you and Chapel were at, at, at loggerheads at that stage. So this story no, is not even... That, not doing that series. Came out a lot later. No. Okay, but uh, the, the, what, what I'm going to say is it, it, it was the second or the third morning, or there might have been the, the fourth morning, just before lunch, um, and Eddie Barlow's bowling to, to Ian Chappell, and Chappelle 
who unfortunately by Bill Laurie had been named as the, the best batsman in the world by, by, quite, a, by quite a distance. Um, just come from India, done, done very well. They'd beaten India in India, which at that stage was, was very difficult to do. And I'm at, uh, 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 Graham's at first slip, I'm at second slip, Dennis Lindsay's keeping, Eddie Barlow's Bolly and Chapel. And we know Chapelli's a very, very good hooker. And Bunter's got a good bouncer. It's a surprise bouncer. So Bunter's bowling is about 10 minutes before lunch. He runs up and bowls. And we are just waiting for Eddie to bowl a bouncer. And Dennis, Lindsay, and Graham, I said, come on, Bunt, bowl about, give him a bouncer. This ball, give him a bouncer. He doesn't do it. The next over is complete. There's two minutes before lunch. Bowler's going to bowl the last over. Come on, Eddie, you've got to bowl a bouncer. Bowl it. The second to last ball before lunch, Eddie bowls a brilliant bouncer. What happens? Ian Chappell goes on the hook. He splices it very gently to mid-on. And who's feeling it mid-on but the good doctor? And the doctor <laughs> spills it. The doctor dropped it. I, tell you, I have never seen anyone. Not, only, not only, only dropped it, it hit my wrist. It didn't even go in the palm of my hands. And, Mike, as I got up, I looked to the open stand, and my brother had come from Jobu to watch the match. And I saw him just walk down the stairs and leave the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, rem I remember you standing in the dressing room, looking out onto Kingsmead for the duration of lunch. <laughs> anyway, we, we won the test match pretty comfortably. So interesting times there. Good fun. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Th thank you for that. So, so just moving on from that brilliant test series where you uh, where the Australians were, were drubbed 4-0, you were obviously there at that point looking forward to the upcoming tour of, uh, of England, which was supposed to start in May 1970. Um, but as I said earlier, the storm clouds had been gathering by that time uh, with uh, a, a lot to do with Peter Haynes' uh, anti-apartheid demonstrations against the Springboks rugby tour, which had happened a few months earlier, where um, the, the rugby tour had been um, uh, significantly disrupted. And the authorities in, in the UK uh, realised very quickly that um, trying to provide security for a, rug, for a rugby match is one thing, for a five-day test match is quite something else. And eventually, as we all know, the tour was, was called off. Would you like to just share your thoughts about that? First of all, how excited you were um, about coming to England and then the disappointment of it being called off. Look, to be honest, I never <coughs> felt the tour was going to take place. Uh, the reason being very simple, that the Labour Party were in power. Harold Wilson was very strong. He had a majority in Parliament. And I, I just couldn't even get excited because I just knew it would never take place. And that's what happened. Uh, just, it was impractical. And like you said, they've, you know, laws five days it to you know, get security people to prevent people from running on the field would have been impossible. So I wasn't surprised. I didn't get excited. I knew it wouldn't take place. Mike? Yeah, I, I agree totally with Ollie. I, I, I'll never forget going back to 68, I think it was, when um, Dolavira played in the fifth test against Australia, in the Ashes series, and Dolavira got 150. And then he was left out of the, of the team that, that was meant to tour South Africa. And I think from then, uh, as you, as you said, the, the clouds, the dark clouds were, were looming overhead. And I agree with Ollie, there was no, no way, because I'd been playing cricket in England, 68 and 69, and then 70 came along. I mean, I, re I realised that that tour that was never, ever going to take place. But I must just say, um, to have the opportunity to then play for and represent the rest of the world under the great Gary, Sir Gary Sobers uh, was actually fantastic. It really was one of the most enjoyable series that I've ever played in. It was, it was such a wonderful side. We had such good team spirit, camaraderie between all of us. You know, we still keep in contact. And, um, you know, the, te the tests actually were, were pretty closely contested. Uh, the, fir the, the first test, just summing up Gary Sobers, uh, the first test match we played at Lords, And uh, England batted first. Uh, they ground their way very slowly to about 120. Sobers taking seven for about 30. Bowling, bowling quick, pretty quick. He was a bit like Wazam Akram, about that pace, and swung the ball around. Um, so we bowled him out in, in about 40, 45 overs. Gary bowled 20 overs, seven for something. Then in the uh, our, our, when we batted, uh, we got a huge score. 
and Gary just walked into the crease and smacked it around for, I think, three hours for about 175 or 180. And then England batted again, and the wicket was very flat now, and Gary now bowled a lot of spin, took a couple of wickets bowling spin. And then in his, in his lovely, lovely mannerisms and lovely way in the dressing room, very, very casually said, well, okay, guys, we'll see you at 10 bridge for the next test. You know, as if nothing had happened. You know, it was it was just it was just amazing. But the camaraderie amongst us was was fantastic, and uh, you know, something I, I really it feels warm in my heart when I think about it. Yeah, I, I was going to come on to that test series um, uh, and go into a bit more detail, but time is running away with us a bit. So what I suggest is that we move quickly forward to 1991 and just say a few words about. Um, the, Ali play in uh, getting South Africa readmitted to international cricket. By that time, of course, Mandela had been released from prison. That was in February 1990. And um, the, the national government uh, had started dismantling the apartheid legislation. And the country was moving into a different era uh, with free elections to look forward to that, that happened in 1994. So, um, but the umbilical cord, for want of a better expression, between the isolation in 1970 and the readmittance in 1990 was you two gentlemen, because um, Ali was captain in 1970, the last test series. Mike was one of the star performers. Move forward to 1991, Ali is team manager and Mike is team coach. So uh, for me, that's quite a sort of a tangible link between the two. Um, so... Ali, would you like to say a few words about um, how difficult it was, the sorts of things you had to go through to get South Africa readmitted to uh, international cricket? Look, the, the, the key factor here, because the INC now were unbanned, uh, was a development program. Mike helped me. Uh, we started this in 1986 of taking cricket on a significant basis to the black township, to the young children. You know, it used to be said that blacks could only play soccer, it was rubbish. Once we started and we saw there was potential, it grew in momentum. And because of that, the ANC started to support the United Cricket Board of South Africa, purely because they saw that there was a genuine desire to, to make cricket a game for all South Africans. Um, the key person here, was not me, it was the late Steve Schwetti. Uh, he was in Robben Island for 15 years, then went into Zambia. He was adored by Nelson Mandela, very close to Tarby and Becky. And he was a key factor in helping to unite black South African cricket and white South African cricket. He was a key factor. And it's incredible to think back, Mike, that democracy constitutionally only came into South Africa in 1994. But in 1991, Tabo Mbeki gave a letter to me and to Steve to go to the ICC to tell them that they support a readmission back into world cricket. And not only that, we went to India in November of 91. I mean, Mike was the, the coach. No South African plane had ever, ever flown over India. In 1948, when the Nationalist Party came into power, the first country to leave the embassy was India. And here in 1991, we're off into India uh, to play a three one-day matches. It was unbelievable. And Mike will tell you, when, when we arrived in Calcutta and drove to our, uh, to our hotel, they estimate there were 100,000 people on the streets to welcome South Africa into India and into world cricket. Unbelievable. Now, Michael recall the first game, it was on a Sunday uh, at Eden Gardens. They reckon there was about 95,000 people uh, in the ground and probably about 20,000 people out the ground. And the, the, noise of fun, the noise was unbelievable. And we won the toss and we batted. And Mike, I was on the ground and I'm sure you too, um, Jimmy Cook was our opening partner to, to open the batting. And the first ball that coupled did bowled in the middle of the week, that was the end of our opening batsman. I mean, the emotion, the cheering, it was unbelievable. I've never had an experience like this. And um, I'm just saying, privileged that many of us had this opportunity to, 
of having gone to India on a very historic moment, not only for our country, but for South African cricket. A visit you made to see Mother Teresa. Absolutely. And I've got photographs in my home. Absolutely. And Mike's in that photograph with her. Uh, extraordinary experience. I mean, we had three one-day games. Uh, the third game was in New Delhi, which we beat them. But we lost the series 3-1. And an interesting part that when we got to Calcutta, their honorary secretary who really ran the cricket, he wasn't a professional administrator, was a late Mr. Delmia, who eventually chaired ICC. So when I met him for the first time, but I'd spoken to him on the phone about 40 times about this tour, I said to him, look, South African viewers want to watch the television. We need to have this TV shown this in South Africa. And you know, his eyes popped up because at that time, the national broadcast was due to shine. They televised matches only in India and they didn't pay the Indian credit board any money. So when I said to him, look, I've got Panasonic in South Africa, they'll give you 250,000 rand to show the three matches in South Africa, his eyes opened up. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. So the whole of South Africa saw it. And from that moment on, Dalmia drove, drove a certain direction of getting more and more money for Indian cricket. And today, I mean, they're, they're a billionaire con concern. And that started with our tour and my meeting with Dalmia in Calcutta. You're probably not too popular with the uh, the original broadcasters who were getting it for nothing then. <laughs> the cut that, that followed immediately after that trip to India, I think it was in Australia, wasn't it? The 1992 World Cup where uh, South Africa um, really weren't expected to do very well and ended well, up... Well, we weren't, weren't, not, not expected. We got readmitted in June 91. We just wanted to be part of the family to be members of the ICC. When we went to Lords, we never discussed playing international cricket at the moment or going to the World Cup. During that trip to London, I met Clive Lloyd at Lords. And I suggested that he come out to South Africa and help us with our development program in townships. And he said, great. So he came out in August. And the second day, he phoned me and he said, I want to see Nelson Mandela. So I phoned Steve and I arranged the next day. So we went up into the top floor. It was, the building was owned by Shell. We we're waiting there and there are a lot of Swedish journalists who'd come to South Africa to meet the great man, Nelson Mandela. So the door opens and there's Nelson Mandela. That's August 91. I see him for the first time. And he sees Steve, Clive and myself, he said, come in. So he only spoke to us for about three minutes. And he said he had heard that we were all trying to take cricket to the black kids. And he said, well done, keep it going. And then one of the Swedish journalists said, what about South Africa playing in the World Cup? And he said, of course they must play. That went round the world in five minutes. The next day, I got a phone call from the president of Sri Lankan cricket. He said, Ali, we've got to have an urgent ICC meeting. So we all go to the United Arab Emirates to have an urgent meeting to discuss South Africa playing in the World Cup. So people flew from the West Indies, flew from Australia. The meeting lasted 40 minutes. There was one abstention in the West Indies. And they only said, not because they were opposed to us going to the World Cup, but the West Indies, as you know, it's composed of a lot of different islands, different presidents of countries. So they had to get permission from all these presidents. And there wasn't time to do it. So they abstained. 45 minutes, vote, and we go to the World Cup in Australia in 1992. And that was the power of this man. I mean... There's some extraordinary stories about him. Um, you know, he's certainly the greatest South African we've ever had. And he's one of the great men of the 20th century. And I was privileged through Steve 
to meet with him on quite a few occasions. Uh, he wrote the foreword for my book. And, you know, we had some lovely moments together. The most unbelievable person. He always said, you know, he had 27 years in jail. He said, look, uh, you can forgive, but don't forget. Because if you forget, it will happen again. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I've got some beautiful stories about him. You know, the 95 Rugby World Cup final New Zealand, South Africa at Ellis Park, Saturday afternoon, game starts at 3. I'm told reliably at 2.30, his bodyguard knocks on the door of the Springbok rugby team. Can the president come in? So he goes in, and I'm told by Joel Stransky, our fly off, that he spoke to every one of our rugby players, one-on-one, quietly, telling them how important it was for the country to win that match. And then the teams get onto the field, and unbelievably so, you know, he's the host country, so the president of the country must go and you know, welcome both teams and wish him well. He walks onto the field with a Springbok rugby jersey. Now, you know, in all these big occasions, suit times. Look, I've been to sporting events. I have never, ever heard an ovation like that. And you must remember that at that time, the overwhelming majority of the spectators were white and most of them were Afrikaners. And I asked him one day, why did he do that? He said, to you, Ali, you know why? Let me tell you. I'm the first black president of this country. The way the Afrikaner have supported me, and I know how they love the rugby, I did it for that reason. And I'm told reliably that, but later, the ANC called him to a big meeting. They were f- furious, fed up with him that he wore that Springbok jersey and, the, and then he endorsed it because the Springbok jersey in the days of apartheid, only whites could play for it. And I'm told they called to see him. I'm told that meeting lasted 20 minutes. He just had such, I wouldn't say power, just there's, there's just something about him. I mean, he he was the most extraordinary person this country's ever met and that I've ever met. That, that's, a, that's a very moving story. And I mean, he clearly was an extraordinary man. Um, and, and as you say, one of the greatest men of the 20th century, uh, without a doubt. And that moment in the 1995 uh, Cup final, which is shown in the film Invictus so well, um, yeah. uh, really was an iconic moment. There's no two ways about it. Um, so I think... There's a lot more we could have talked about. I wanted to explore a little bit more of the World Cup, a little bit more of the England versus the rest of the world series in 1970. And I also wanted to explore a little bit more about what went on in South Africa during those 20 years of isolation, because through my reading, I understand there was a lot going on towards um, uh, getting multiracial cricket which the country has never really been given much credit for. So maybe we have to leave that for another time. I know, Ali, you've said that very kindly that you'd be very happy to come back on for a future event. And so what I would suggest is that we hold fire on all of that and and indeed come back to it in a a future event. Mike Proctor is a special person. We've had a close relationship from day one, day one. He once stayed at my house in Parkmore, and his wife was a very good tennis player. Very good. Yeah. And as a young kid, as a young kid, I thought I was a good tennis player too. So I, I challenged her to a match on a Sunday at my brother-in-law's house. And Mike, you can recall, I got my whole my family to come and support me. I think the score was six love, six one, and not in my favour. Welcome to both Andy Brassington and Jack Davey, who both played for Gloucestershire during the 70s. Maybe you two guys can talk a little bit about the relationship that you had with Mike during those playing days um, and perhaps focus on some of the the big matches that, that many Gloucestershire supporters will remember, such as the, the semi-final of the... Uh, of the um, uh, of the Gillette Cup in 1971 in Manchester, the final of the uh, of the Benson and Hedges in 77, and the Gillette 
final in 73. Uh, Jack, do you want to go first? Yep, sure, uh, certainly. Um, I'd just like to say, I think that uh, Ali had it tops when he said that uh, Mike Proctor was a very special person because um, he certainly was and he is, uh, certainly for what he's doing today for all those children. But really, when he joined us, he had he was like a breath of fresh air. The only problem with him was he, he knows little about cars. <laughs> I hope it's improved from those days. But um, like most overseas players, he was given a higher car um, to use for his own purposes, and they would sponsor it. Well, he picked me up one day and took me, I think it was to Worcester, uh, to play, and obviously he was going to bring me back afterwards. And uh, we had to get some fuel in Worcester, which uh, he got out and was waiting for somebody to come. I said, I expect this, you, you've got to do this yourself. Okay, he said, well, I showed him what to do. And I said, we've had this thing a couple of, a couple of months now. I said, do you check the oil? So he said, well, where's that? I said, well, under the bonnet. So I said, I'll have a look for you. So I opened up the bonnet and there was just a little bit of oil on the tip of the dipstick. And I went to him around the side of the car, filling up. He said, look, you've only got that amount. I'll leave a bottle open, buy some oil in there and make sure you put it in the engine. Yeah, OK, so I'll do that. When I went back and sat in the car, put the radio on. He came out, saw him with some oil. Went in front of the um, cars. I'm assuming he's putting the oil in. And I was still there a couple of minutes later. He hadn't come in. And I thought, oh, well, he must be talking to somebody. Nothing still. So I went out, I got out, and I said, you okay, you've got a problem. He said, well, look, man, he said, it's, it's such a small hole. So I said, what do you mean it's a small hole? He said, well, look, look. look. And I went around to the underneath of the bonnet of the car there, and he was trying to put the oil back in where he took the dipstick out of. <laughs> so I showed him the proper place. And I said, well, haven't you done this before? No, he said, when we stopped for petrol, he said, all the guys on, on the garage come and do it for us. <laughs> so, uh, he was very lucky. He didn't seize the engine up. I'll but just jump in there, Jack, if that's OK, with uh, talking about propping cars. Um, I remember we played Northampton's three-day game, and on the we, we finished the three days, and prop filled up with what we thought was petrol to drive us back oh. to Bristol. And we, we managed to get out the forecourt and 20 yards down the road when the car came to a sudden in halt. And uh, <laughs> on reflection, we Prop just couldn't work out or we couldn't work out what was wrong with the car. And we were so close to the petrol station, we, we, we walked back into the petrol station, we asked Prop which pump he actually put in. And he'd actually filled the car up with diesel. So we, we spent a couple of hours waiting for the AA to come before we got back to Bristol. But yeah, um, yeah obviously not a good car man at all. No, not at all. No, no, I, apart from that, he had everything right, just about. Uh, Mike, we were, uh, Andy and Jack have just told a couple of car stories about you. Um, uh, probably just as well you didn't hear the first one. Um, would I you heard have... the second one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> was that, I think that was in there. We've been playing Warwickshire, I think. Was there Warwickshire, was it? Yeah, yeah, I think it was Warwickshire. Yeah. And I just casually filled up the car with petrol. You know? Well, I thought it was. Diesel petrol didn't make any difference to me anyway, so... Yeah. Anyway, My, Mike Bryan of the car sponsor wasn't very happy. I'm sure they weren't. I'm sure they weren't. Um, would you like to uh, give us some of your memories of the uh, 1971 semi final against uh, Lancashire? The 71 semi final against Lancashire, that's uh, not, not great memories, that, Rog. I mean, the one, one thing I do remember about it is was we had a few drinks that evening. David Green, myself, I think Arthur Milton or Ron Nichols or some about three or four of us. And uh, we just walked around town in a bit of a daze, going from pub to pub and really couldn't go to sleep that night. But the whole history of that game was, it was a, a, a game that was curtailed by rain, a semi-final game. Uh, we, we made about 260, 270. I think I got about 50 odd. Uh, then it, it rained and it was delayed. Then Lancashire went into bat, obviously late, and it didn't look like that we were going to finish the, the 60 overs. Um, and then Jack Bond was in when it was getting very dark. Tony Brown was our captain. And the two of them decided, because there was about six, seven overs left, the two of them decided 
that they're going to continue this game because there was a huge crowd in. It was really coming at Old Trafford. And it was going to be a great game of cricket. Um, then Jack Bond got out. Simmons came in and played a bit. Then David Hughes came in. And there were, there were about five overs, five overs left. And I'd said to Tony Brown, now Dickie Bird was, was at my end where I was bowling. And you could see the station lights on. At this stage, I think it was just after nine o'clock, the BBC News, BBC were, were, were televising the game. And they, they delayed the, the nine o'clock news to, to show this game live. And I said to Tony Brown, I said, I said, Brownie, I said, just leave John, leave John Mortimer for the, the last over. I said, by the time I've finished mine, it'll be too dark for anyone to, to see anything. And he, said, he sort of didn't quite realize what I was saying. But I remember my second to last over that I bowled. I bowled the last over, I think, when Jack Simmons smacked me for a four to win the game or something. But um, Dickie Bird, I, I was then sort of taking my time a little bit. Um, and Dickie was said, oh, hurry up, Rock, hurry up, Rock. I said, Dickie, I've just been batting. Now I've been bowling. I'm in my ninth, tenth over. I said, I can't go any faster. Oh, okay, you're going to go. See. But, you know, I had it planned. It might have not have been too good, but uh, if if it uh, if I was going too quickly through the overs, I'll just you know make me bowl an oval, mm -hmm. uh, which would give me another another minute or two to to make it darker. But a very very exciting game, and the hardest part about that was actually the batsmen had the best view because they had a side screen. I remember fielding at at long on when uh, David Hughes went absolutely berserk and and hit the twenty six or whatever what was runs to get them within within a couple of runs of, of the winning total. And he hit one. I remember looking around. I, I thought it I thought it was coming on the leg side. And I, I thought it was in my direction. And I was looking up, trying to find the ball. And the ball actually went over mid, mid off, deep mid off. Uh, so the, the field is, it was really, really tough. And it, although it was dark for the batsman, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't impossible, that's for sure. But uh, a, a great game of cricket, uh, 1971, 50 years ago. And maybe we can have a celebration, or Lancashire can have a celebration on that game. Yeah. Well, as as you know, we are we are thinking about that. So, for the benefit of the attendees, we are looking at a, a specific event to celebrate that fiftieth uh, anniversary. Although, by the time with COVID, by the time we uh, are actually able to do it, it'll probably be the fifty-first anniversary. But um, more about that um, uh, uh, anon. Um, Let's move on to um, brighter, brighter things then. Uh, Gloucestershire's first ever cup win in 1973 when you beat uh, Kent at Lords. Yeah, very exciting times. Um, Jack, do you want to do you want to start with that? Yeah, I, I do. But can I just go back to the Old Trafford game with you a minute? Do you remember how you uh, got out at Old Trafford in the semi final? Jack up. Jack, I remember very, very well. Yeah. The guy, umpire was Arthur Jepson. Yeah. And Peter Lever bowled me a, a short ball down the leg side. It might have been a, an attempted bouncer, but it was like more of a long hop down the leg side. I went to have a hook or a pull at it. It came off my gloves. I'd, I'd finished my shot almost before the ball came and it looped up. And the Lancashire wicketkeeper dived and caught the ball. Um, and my recollection of it was that it, he picked it up off the ground, to be honest. What yeah. is yours, Jacker? Well, well, we were. This was long before they turned the square around. The wickets were the other way around. And there was a three or four of us sat on the balcony, which is straight in line with the end that you were batting at. Now, when you push that ball down the leg side, engineer dived across and caught it one handed. <laughs> In midair, as he fell, it dropped out. His body weight had taken him forward. He put his right arm out and picked it up off the floor. He made such a song and dance about it that eventually you were given out, but you weren't out. And what has always upset me is that some of the other players out there, the Lancashire boys, must have known that. I, I, I see Peter Lever quite often down here. He lives 20 miles away. But um, he said he couldn't see it at the time. And he wouldn't have done because probably his follow through would have been covered up by you. But it, it, we were, well, you were cheated out. And as we know, once you got 50 or 60, you didn't stop. And uh, that, that's always infuriated me, that little piece. But to make it worse, 
when I think it was um, something like 30, 35 years later, there was a program that the BBC brought on, a sporting program late at night called The Days of Our Lives, which uh, he, a chap called Dan Go, what was it? Can't, can't remember. It was, it was interviewing uh, two or three people from various sides during the 60s and 70s uh, over their performances. So you do a top football club, rugby club, and cricket county. And Lancashire were brought on because of their success in one day cricket through the 70s. And their panel was Jack Bond, David Lloyd, and Fruit Engineer. And the question master, the host, said to Engineer, I understand there was a bit of a dispute about a catch. And Engineer looked up and said, Oh, yes, he said, but it only bounced, bounced once. <laughs> yeah, you, I can't um, believe a wiki keeper would do that, mate. That's well, terrible. <laughs> I know one that sat not far away. <laughs> but that was, it was disgusting. And nobody else would bother. He should have been called back. But he, he actually said it on live television uh, with Jackie Bond and David Lloyd sat there and their looks on their faces. You would not believe. Absolute, well, shock for a start. But yeah, good, uh, good that was the reason why we lost it. Yeah, good, good story, Jack. Um, uh, we've got a question for both um, Mike and Jack Davy about sharing your memories uh, of um, the um, your important parts, your respective important parts, in the Gloucestershire victory over Sussex in the Cup final in September '73. Uh, and the uh, uh, the writer says that um, Mike scored 94 and took two for 27 and Jack Davy took the key wicket of Roger Prido. But before that, um, I know Andy has some memories of that cup final as well from, a, from a, um, a, a young cricketer's point of view who had just joined Gloucestershire, is that right? I, uh, yeah, Roger, that was my first year. I came down from Stoke-on-Trent as a long-haired, loud mouth young man, and not a lot has changed apart from the hair. <laughs> and um, it, it was amazing to come from a minor county into a first-class county, not knowing a great deal about first-class cricket. But very quickly realizing what a what, what a standard that I had to get to 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 perform at first class level. It, it was a fantastic summer, and although I didn't play a, a first class game, um, I was lucky enough to attend the the cup final in 1973. Um, Tony Brown, the then captain, had given me a couple of days off, so I went to stay with some relatives in Broadstairs and travelled up on the morning of the game. I wasn't in the squad, but I was very much heavily involved with a great bunch of lads. Uh, and, and what a performance, what a, what a great day by the team. And uh, uh, my, my memory, apart from the outstanding performances, Tony Brown, Proc, and that was um, young Jim Foch, who was just a young young boy in his second year as a pro, uh, running out Tony Greg. Uh, Brownie, the captain, had said to Foch, at extra cover, Luke, Greg, he'll actually get off the mark, so make sure you don't let him have a single. And two enough, he pushed one out to the offside and, um, and started to go for a run to Tony Greg. Foti picked it up first time and had the common sense, rather than throw the ball because Gregory was halfway down the wicket, he um, ran to the wicket and just took the bails off before Greg could get back. And it really was a massive turning point in, in, in the game. And Foti had had a fantastic day, obviously, and, and to win the cup and everything. But the day ended a little bit not as Foti had hoped for because during the celebrations, I wasn't a member of the playing squad, but I was certainly a member of the celebration squad afterwards. And uh, we, we had a great time. And Foti hadn't got changed. He was so excited. He got his gold medallion around his neck from his winner's medal. And he decided he was a little bit hungry. And there was a fish and chip shop just around the corner from Laws. And off he went. And we gave him a couple of orders to get some for some of us. And he came back about 20 minutes later in his white kit with all this red all over him. And we thought he'd, he'd spilt the tomato sauce. And what had happened, he, he got in with his kit and he was quite chirpy, having had a few beers and was telling everyone he'd just won the Gillette Cup and show him the gong. And a particular <laughs> Sussex supporter in the chip shop didn't take to Jim and punched him on his nose. And all the red, what we thought was red sauce was all blood all over his whites and all over our fish and chips. Uh, but uh, I think he'd had a couple of drinks, so he didn't feel too much pain. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, any what, what are your memories of that game um, against Sussex? Yeah, obviously, really exciting times for Gloucestershire, have never having won anything, you know, and having had the, getting to Lords, having won the semi final, which is always the toughest game, I think, uh, toughest game to lose semi final. 
um, because you never got a chance of winning. But to, to get into the final was great. Um, the expectations, I think, were fairly high. We were pretty confident. We were, we were man for man, I suppose, the lesser of the two teams. Uh, Sussex had a, a number of chess players, Tony Gregg, John Snow, just to name a couple. Um, so I, I suppose they were, were expected to win. But uh, I remember that what Brassie was talking about, uh, Foti, a great character, Jim Foti, and a brilliant fielder. He really was. And to see a, a, a plan come together and Foti run out Tony Gregg like that was, was fantastic. And I think, that, I think that probably could have swung the game distinctly in our way. It was a uh, bit exciting times, particularly for the Gloucester supporters. Uh, it, it was fantastic, you know. Uh, they had supported me and w- when I first started playing for Gloucester in 1968 and had to win a trophy in, in 73 was, to me, really great for our supporters who, who were, were fantastic supporters, as Jack and Bressy know. Yeah. You probably remember, like, uh, Roger, and any, everyone listening who, who was fond of Gloucestershire, that uh, uh, it was quite often called Proctorshire, which uh, none of the players minded that at all. And the, the sight of Proc running in with his blonde hair flying about in the crowd. What what super supporters we've always had. Screaming, Proctisher, la, 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 Proctisher, la, 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 la. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And my memory as a young lad at that game was the, the, the amount of support, all the people packed into the ground and the fantastic support uh, the Gloucestershire fans gave the team and still do to this very day on all the cup runs and, and whatever. We've, we've got a fantastic club and a fantastic supporters. Yeah, okay, I can... Uh, Thoroughly endorse that, Brush. You're absolutely right. But on that, uh, the evening before um, that Gillette Cup final was played, there were but must have been five or six of us at our evening meal, sat on a wall in the Edgware Road, eating spare ribs and chips. <laughs> Nothing had been laid on for us by the county <laughs> at all. Um, we played, a, I think it was a three day game. I think it was down at. Um, Bournemouth, quite possibly, the day before. So we travelled up on a Friday night in June in all the holiday traffic. We didn't have time to go off very far and get uh, get some proper food, if you like. So we had spare ribs and chips there. Uh, we won the match. No problem. That was that was all done and dusted, all right? Now we had to get in our cars on a Sunday morning and go off to Chesterfield for a John Player match. So... <laughs> I don't know, you've got the cheetahs outside, Proc. They are, they are the hardy dars, aren't they, Mike? Hardy dars, I'm afraid. Hardy dars. Big uh, bird for those who don't know what a hardy dar is. I thought it was Punch and Judy had come on. That's the way to do it! No, sure. no it's a, it was a pretty busy weekend, actually. Yeah. Uh, and when we got to um, Derbyshire, I think we... John Mortimer I had to toss up uh, and there was a danger of me opening the batting up to about five minutes before the game. So there were only about four of us on, on site at Chesterfield. But it was it was good. It was happy days. It was a, it was a great victory. And Jack, usually, I'm surprised the club's dietitian let you eat uh, fish and chips prior to a, um, a final there, mate. What was he doing? Well, there you are. Chap, I went in for a second lot. So. <laughs> Because um, he didn't get enough batter with the first. No, that's how it was. I mean, we talked, um, we didn't know any different. You're talking about the um, semi-final. What We went through all that. We finished at 10 past nine. Fielded four and a half hours without a break. Uh, there was no um, win bonus or anything like that. We had five pound each as our appearance money. So that, it, yeah, uh, different, different days. Obviously, like to thank uh, Ali Backer for his um, contribution and to Andy Brassington and Jack Davey uh, and also to uh, to thank uh, the Cricket Society for co-hosting this with us and to uh, Michelle Page and her team uh, for making the event happen. Um, we are uh, and thank you for everyone who has contributed um, any donations to to Mike's foundation. Um, we're planning another event in June um, and, and we will let um, everybody know uh, as that um, comes together. So um, I will sign off now and say thank you to everybody and hand over to uh, Nigel Hancock, who is chairman of the Cricket Society, to, um, to play us out, so to speak. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank, so thank you, Roger, for um, uh, chairing, cha chairing that, sharing great. Uh, a big thank you to, to Mike Proctor, to Dr. Ali Bakker, um, to um, our, other, our, 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 our other guests, Jack Davey and Andy, and Andy Brassington. So thank you all for that on behalf of not just Cricket Society, but all others who are watching. Stephen Chalk hinted at the beginning that I wanted to say a little bit about um, the future relationship between the Cricket Society and uh, the Mike Proctor Foundation, something I've been talking to about over the last week since the last um, um, event. And, and what I would like to say today is that we, the Cricket Society, have decided that we would like to donate uh, immediate, with immediate effect a thousand pounds to the Mike Proctor foundation this is from a fund we have um, which was left to us by one of our uh, lady members vivian hogarth who wanted us to support in what way we thought best young and needy cricketers well certainly uh, as we've heard today and is on the foundation's website there are a lot of young and needy people in south south africa and mike proctor and his colleagues work is certainly turning them some of them into cricketers into cricketers too so as part of an ongoing I hope relationship uh, that will last beyond this series of uh, joint 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 events with the foundation we would like to make that initial do donation uh, which i hope will supplement some of the individual donations that others are are making so that's all from me from the cricket society thank you very much mike well, Nigel, thank you very much. You know, that, that is really, really fantastic. And it'll certainly go a, a long way to, to help Miss Bassani and the kids maybe get those benches. They, they wanted 10 or 12 benches to put around the school so the kids. And the Mike Proctor Foundation is, is just really excited to, to join hands with the Cricket Society. It, it works, works very, very well. And to you and, and the Cricket Society, a, a very big thank you. And, and can I just say, um, before I, I, I totally finish, is that to Ollie, uh, to Jack, to Brassy. Um, really, it's been great having them, and there's always some lovely stories. And I said to Rog, you know, the stories will come out. You don't know how long it's going to last, and it's always we run out of time. But you know, to them, thank you, thank you very much indeed. And also to to really to to Michelle and and, and Roger, they you know it takes a, a lot of cooperation to, to actually get this up and running. And I know Michelle's worked very hard, Roger's worked very hard. Very much to everyone, you've all been fantastic, and uh, I do appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you at the next series. Take care. Bye.